Welcome to the Creepin' It Real Show, your one-stop shop for weird news, spooky, and otherworldly and paranormal shenanigans. We'll take a dive into what's going on in creepy pop culture. You can follow Creepin' It Real Show on Twitter at creepin underscore it. You can email us at creepinitrealshow at gmail.com. You can also go to our website, creepinitrealshow.com. Without further ado, welcome to this week's episode. Welcome to a belated and much anticipated uh, Creepin' It Real show. I am one of your hosts, Miss Moni, and we will be talking about some new stuff in creepy pop culture as well as some haunted Los Angeles locations. However, I'd like to bring in my co-host um, from Georgia, Mr. Yardley. Hey, how's it going? I'm glad to be here. The home stretch before Christmas, so we definitely needed to knock something out. We made it. Miss Christy, how you doing? I'm good. I'm I'm nervous. Does that make sense? We haven't done one in so long that I'm like kind of nervous about getting back on the horse, but happy to be here and excited about what we're going to talk about. Feels like the very first time. It does. Well, it's funny too, because we've had this document ready to talk, you know, with the topics we were going to do for tonight, we've had it ready for a few weeks. So I kind of feel like some of this is old news to us, um, but we'll get started with, I just watched an OJ Simpson documentary. It is called the Lost Confession. It's available on YouTube right now. It's about an hour and a half of your life that you'll spend being angry. Um, <laughs> but there is going to be yet another documentary coming out for the 25th anniversary, as if we're celebrating these murders, whomever did them, whatever you believe. Um, but Yardley, you had some commentary about this back in the days did you have a take well, on this new theory that oj had someone else that helped him with this well i was basically saying that you know i think that this is definitely all about money but i think it was something along the lines how it was saying the most uh comprehensive and you know exhaustive you know study in the evidence and i was basically saying and i know christy can attest to this when that oj stuff was going on yeah that was non-stop for well oh. over a year Mm-hmm. Like you, you oh, heard definitely. about yeah about everything, so I just think that this is a is another cash you know cash grab, and it's it's just it's almost like it's almost like sad that he's even in the news anymore. It's so funny because I remember this as clear as day when his um when the verdict came in. I was working at a deli, and this is how naive I was to um just government in general and court. And just the whole process, um, I remember when they came back with the not guilty verdict, I was so happy and relieved that it wasn't him. Like, I believed that that if they said he's not guilty, then he must not be guilty. Like, I, it's just so, and of course, you know, th- there's a lot to be, you know, said about what happened in, in the whole court process, but Um, and I remember a guy in the kitchen that was standing with me was like, why are you happy? And I was like, (laughs) because he's not guilty. (laughs) And they're like, no, he's guilty. And I'm like, what? Like, I just had no, I mean, I was like 20, you know? So I just had no idea. I thought, well, they said he's not guilty. Then he's not guilty. He didn't do it. And that makes me happy. And they're like, no, no, he did it. (laughs) And I was like, oh, I'm confused. Then why is he not guilty? (laughs) Like duh, oh, he was so popular, <laughs> such a popular. Yeah, I loved you know, him. Guy at the I was, time. he's yeah, adorable. Yeah. yeah, and this was my first big um, news story that I remember. Kind of when you remember, like, as a young person, the first news story that really, like, whatever generation you are, whether it was Kennedy's assassination for me, it was mm-hmm. OJ because that was in the '90s, and yeah. I was like a teenager and. Um, definitely though, this is going to be a theme that comes up throughout the things that we talk about tonight, which is police mishandling of things and unfortunately allowed what I believe to be a murderer to go free to this day. And regarding, you know, the money grab, he still owes the Goldman's that settlement money. And I think what he's trying to do at this point is basically, make enough money from doing books, from doing these, these documentaries, all these speaking engagements. 
and to surpass what he owes them to finally kind of start making money again. Mm -hmm. And I tell you what, you watch the, the YouTube documentary that's available now and it's just a 90 minutes. It, it sits down with him and they ask him, you know, so what happened that night? Well, this is hypothetical, but he's laughing. Yeah. Uh, this guy, Charlie and I, we brought a knife because he can't carry a gun around. So we brought a knife. And Charlie gave me the knife, and then he even says, and then I blacked out, and it's just like, he drops this Charlie act, you know, not even halfway through recounting what happened that day, and it, it, it'll make your blood boil. It's, it's really gross, and he's, the only time he shows real emotion is not when he talks about losing the mother of his child, like, for his mm -hmm. kids to have to deal with that or any of that. The most emotion he shows is how angry he is that she's dead because he wanted to take her, get her back to tell her he told her so about the way she was living her life. <laughs> wow. And, <laughs> and and something else about this is it was, you know, how like a lot of people always say, well, you know, if that was the case, there had to be someone else there. So in part of this was they're saying for the first time, they'll reveal that he had at least one, uh, one more accomplice. So at least an entourage of accomplices. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, but it's the it's the it's the news story that won't die. Apparently, I've been apparently. I've been up in and out uh, sick. And uh, Rick has been in the bed in the bed with flu for six straight days. But um, I've been watching a lot of um, documentaries, and I'm trying to find the name of the one I watched, um, talking about like mishandling evidence and poor investigation practices. But um, it is this guy, and he was like an exchange, or his dad was a diplomat from, and they were from Germany, and he met this girl. And he uh, admitted to killing her parents, but now he's come back and said that she actually did it, but he loved her so much and he could get immunity. And so he agreed. Anyway, it, I, I got, I'm trying to find the name of it. And I can't remember if I watched it on Hulu or Netflix, but it's one of those. And it was fascinating um just how they handled this case and now the dna evidence has come available and he is not in any of the dna and they still refuse to retry him so anyway i i'm gonna try to find the name of it and let you know but that would be another awesome you know talking about uh you know just how broken our system can be uh another um, one yeah if you find it, just holler throughout while we're talking here. And this theme is going to come up in a few minutes when we talk about the Cecil Hotel. There's something like that with involving police mishandling of things that led to a murderer getting away with a lot more crimes. And it'll come up again again when we're discussing the Black Dahlia murder case briefly here tonight. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, while you're trying to kind of locate that, Mr. Yardley, tell us about what's going on with the Child's Play reboot. Yeah, the um, the Child's Play reboot has a viral marketing campaign going on at bestbuddy.com. And the um, for people who aren't familiar, uh, the, the new cast members for this is Brian Tyree Henry, who plays Paperboy in Atlanta, Beatrice Kitsos from Foxes the Exorcist, and Ty Consiglio from Wonder. So if you go to the website, they have wallpapers and another link that's coming soon to castlincorp.com. So I guess they're going to explore the corporate angle of this as well. It has a buddy announcement about the toy. So for me and all of the things that we've heard, even in previous articles that we talked about on other shows, it seems like they're going to tech out Chucky instead of going the possession angle like they had uh, okay. in the original. Okay. So would any of you prefer them to kind of take ownership of this and go in that route? Or do you kind of like the original way that Chucky was? I just kind of feel like if they're going to go that route, maybe somebody will hack, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The, yeah. the yeah. toy. And then I'm excited. Go I'm excited about this. Like I, I'm getting down with it. I, I don't know how they're going to spin it. I'm glad they're making it more modern. Um, you have to with stuff like that. So when you sent me this link and I saw, I think, weren't you the first person that sent the art or the poster? Didn't you post that, Yardley? The yeah, I believe I, I think I, I did. When I saw the you poster, did. I was like, okay, that looks fucking creepy. And then when I looked at this, I'm, I'm excited about it. I don't know how anybody else feels, but I, I'll definitely go see it. Yeah. I mean, possession is always one of the things that I find to be a scary concept. So honestly, that concept done well would have still worked for me. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But 
I'm interested to see what they'll do. I mean, I do like, I do appreciate update and not doing this exact same thing because what's the point of that? Yeah. Um, although artificial intelligence, if that's kind of what they're going to go with, turns it into more of a sci-fi movie than a horror. So we'll just kind of have to see what the marketing is freaking cool. So that's yeah. exciting. Looks- yeah. I think that this is going to be a, there's a, I think there's going to be a big corporate slant behind it. So I think when they develop this thing, it's going to have the money behind it to make it really advanced. Yeah. But as far as the possession angle, I mean, for me, it's probably scarier to have something that doesn't have emotions. Like, you know, the other Chucky would get pissed off. It would lighten up. Mm-hmm. But, this is, but this is just a straightforward. <laughs> just, Killing machine. Yeah, exactly. None of that extra. So we'll see what's going on. Maybe I'm totally wrong. It's like our discussions of the sex toys that get hacked. It's like all this technology that you have in your home that you trust. Like, here's a toy for my kid. Here's a sex toy for me. And it, it all goes wrong when you involve technology. So mm-hmm. that's that's the moral of that story. So what's going on, Christy, with um, the marriage of a uh, man? <laughs> okay, listen. This, I, this has nothing to do with paranormal or horror or weirdo things, but... This has been my life story because I grew up in New Mexico and you would not believe the stupidity that is out there um, with New Mexico being a state. Um, I came across it when I was in middle school and I traveled to Disney World for a trip and I remember standing in line and talking to this girl and her mom was like, so where are you from? And she was, you know, clearly from somewhere in the South. And I said, from New Mexico. And she's like, well, you don't look Spanish. You you don't look like. Do you do you speak Spanish? I'm like, well, no, because I'm not Spanish. Oh, what the actual fuck. And they she I, and I said, and she goes, well, how long have you been in the country? And I'm like, I was born in Texas, and I live in New Mexico, so my whole life. And she just wasn't. I mean, the eyes were blank, but you know, it was like <laughs> lights were on. Nobody was home. I'm like, because oh. you know, New Mexico is a state. You know. I, I have had this happen to me so many times that when I saw this, I was like, this still happens? Seriously? So this dude in D.C. <laughs> um, went to file for his marriage certificate, and they wouldn't give it to him because of his foreign New Mexico ID card. So, yeah, for the record, <laughs> New Mexico became a state in 1912. Um, and I, again, my life story, this poor guy, um, went to try to go get married and they wouldn't let him because they thought that New Mexico is Mexico. They think it's, there's old Mexico and New Mexico. And I've heard this many times. So I just had to put this out there that y'all, uh, New Mexico is a state. The end. That's all. What is it? They have a slogan there. Don't they? That it's like not Mex, not new and not Mexico. It's I don't know. Land of Enchantment <laughs> is the their like state saying. But I've seen I, not when not Mexico somewhere, and I'm like, well, oh, that's I'm sure spot. because no. I mean because <laughs> this is what happens. This is like crazy that we still have to have this conversation. And well, there's a lot of things that we have to talk about that are crazy in this year of our Lord, not you know 2018. But this being one that still is a discussion that New Mexico is a state. It's there. It, it exists. Africa is a continent. New Mexico yep. is a state. I feel like we should just do like a basic geography. Yeah, it's <laughs> a really, right it's a really big fucking state. And if you heard of Roswell, then you heard of New Mexico for fucking crying <laughs> out loud. So I just so and then I, when I say I'm from Roswell, New Mexico, the first thing people say is, "Ooh, Area 51." I'm like, no, wrong state. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> like get your state settled. I know that it's desert and I know there's not a lot going on over there except for aliens and shit like that. But um oh by the way, Yard League, did you feel the earthquake at four thirty this morning? I did. Absolutely not. God damn. I did. <laughs> I was awake. I was in a hotel downtown. What are for you work. guys doing having an earthquake? Dude. That's supposed to be our thing. I know. We have, right? we have earthquakes. That's what we do. I didn't even hear about it till I got to work. Dude, I was laying there. I was in a hotel because we had a um, work thing this whole week. And so instead of me having to drive up here and work late, they were like, just get a hotel room by the airport because that's where I work down by the airport. And I, w- I slept for shit because I have a sinus infection, blah, blah, blah. I know I sound 80. That's just how it works. 
when you get old. But um, I couldn't sleep, so I was laying there, and my bed shook, and then I heard the window rattle. And I was like, what the hell was that? And I thought, it's an earthquake. And then I was like, no, it's probably some, like, like back elevator for, like, the cleaning people, like, didn't, is malfunction. Like, I was just... And then I was like, whatever. And then I got in my car to go to work this morning, and everybody was talking about the earthquake. And I was like, holy shit, that was an earthquake. Like, I was blown away. First time well, for me. Yeah. As exciting as that is, it rocked your world. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm super excited about what we're about to talk about next, which is one of my favorite horror movies being rebooted, although I don't know how I feel about it. So, Yardley, explain to the people what's going on, and then we'll discuss. All right, so this past September, Bloody Disgusting had exclusively broke the news that Jordan Peele's Monkey Paw Productions would be producing a remake of the Bernard Rose-directed Candyman, a chilling urban horror film, for those who don't know, that was adapted from Clive Barker's Books of Blood short story, The Forbidden. It was also confirmed that same week that Peele hired Nia DaCosta to direct. This has been confirmed with the news that it is being billed as a spiritual sequel that returns to the neighborhood where the legend began, which is now a gentrified section of Chicago where the Cabrini Green housing projects once stood. So MGM will release this film on June 12th, 2020. So I have a question for both of you. What do we think about Jordan Peele handing the directorial reins to someone who only has one film under their belt? Uh, Nia DaCosta um, directed Little Woods, which actually has 100% on Rotten Tomatoes, but it only has 16 reviews, but it has an audience score of 80%. And the movie that she directed, uh, the synopsis is a woman, West, a modern Western that tells the story of two sisters, Ali and Deb, who are driven to work outside the law to better their lives. For years, Ali has illicitly helped the struggling residents of her North Dakota oil boomtown access Canadian health care and medication. When the authorities catch on, she plans to abandon her crusade only to be dragged in deeper after a desperate plea for help from her sister. Now, Tessa Thompson stars in this, Lance Reddick, Lily James, and James Badge Sounds good to Dale. me. Yeah, but I, it doesn't sound anything that would make me think that, you know... I don't know, like that type of movie, then jump into that. But hey, for all I know, her passion might have been horror to begin with. But that movie sounds pretty good. I had never heard of it until I kind of um, IMDb'd her name. So, had y'all heard of Little Woods, or do no, you feel I confident? Didn't. I do think I have faith that Jordan Peele can pick someone, though, that he has confidence, uh, you know, confidence in something that. He's going to have his name attached to yeah. to do well. So. I mean, after Get Out, if you start that strong, I'm, I'm going to have faith in you because Get Out is probably one of my favorite horror films. Like, it's in the top top five, I would say. I really love that movie. So I think – and I could see him being able to handle Candyman. Candyman is a different type of horror Um, and it's always, I know so many people, it's their favorite. It's one of their favorites. It's one of my favorites. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm going to have some faith in him because I really respected what he's done so far. I am just so excited to see a new story coming out of the Candyman ilk. Um, that being said, I'm always afraid to be that excited because God knows what we'll get. I feel like, you know, what's nice, too, is it's not coming out till 2020, which kills me because I want to see it now, but (laughs) also gives me a little bit of faith that they're taking their time with this and not just trying to rush it out for a money grab or anything like that. Um, I have no idea who you could tap to play Candyman. Mm, That's going to be hard. You're not going to you're not going to beat Tony Todd. And quite frankly, Tony Todd did. um, Oh, my God. I can't remember right now. But those movies where everybody like uh, Final Destination Mm. and he still looks amazing and he still sounds amazing. And I wish they do him him come back and be OG Candyman because. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Well, Well, how many he was just in. He was in the first one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The first two. And he you was know, in a, I, I don't know. He was in a lot of them. He's the uh, guy that is the uh, one that kind of explains to them what's happening. He plays like yeah. a mortuary pers- worker yes, or something, he was. and he had that still that creepy deep voice. That, yeah, like, it was great. Um, 
I am actually so into Candyman that I even um, looked into Cabrini Green as like a place. And so it's interesting to me that they are doing the updated to show that it has been gentrified. I, I would have already been like, no, if they were trying to pretend that it was the same place that it is because they've torn it down. That place has a bad history. That alone, it's kind of like a haunted location. It's very interesting. Um, I, I encourage you, if you ever get a chance, to just look into Cabrini Green and, and kind of the different variations of it. I think there's a lot of potential here, too, to talk about, you know, race and even class and that kind of thing, because that was a lot of what the original film focused on and to show it gentrified but still kind of having the same neighborhood around it. I think it's going to be super interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems like Little Woods is a character driven story so I think if the worst problem that Jordan Peele has is that somebody has such positive feedback about their first film which appears to be character driven it would be great to get a movie like Candyman with someone who knows how to really play out characters you know throughout the course of a film so I'm going to check that movie out and uh, yeah I look forward to it as well nice Christy has late breaking developments, yes. Killing for Love. Killing for Love's the documentary name. Uh, I okay. think it's on Netflix. It could be on Hulu. It's one of them. Which, by the way, y'all, Hulu is 99 cents. They have a special. Uh, we got it for like a year or something. Uh, so if y'all are in oh, for really? <laughs> yeah, I might need to do that because their exactly. platform crashes for me constantly that it isn't, hasn't been worth the five bucks. Yeah, honestly. they have Handmaiden's Tale, um, mm -hmm. and they have shitty horror. So just know it was so funny. Like I said, I have been in and out of the bed, uh, just whatever the hell is going around. I don't even know. There's plagues going everywhere, but, um, so I was, you hey, know, future man's on there too. There's yeah. And season two is about to come up. There's lots of good shows. Of course, Saturday night live is exclusively on there. Um, but I got on there to look at their horror. So I pulled up my rotten tomatoes in my IMDB. Cause there's a bunch of titles I'd never heard of. And I was like, Ooh, is this like some cool indie horror that maybe I've not seen? And everything had like a 2.5 or like a three point rating. And I was like, Oh, these are just really shitty horror movies. So, Oh, my don't... girlfriend <laughs> treated me to the best night in the other night and was like, let's watch Hulu original and I was so excited and bless her because we had a fun time anyway but everything that we watched on Hulu was just like not good not good not good yeah. so bad so the so bad documentaries are solid I'm pretty sure I saw this I got this one on Hulu because it's the first thing I started watching and I started out on Hulu just curious about what they had um and so I, and this killing for love is on there and then like you guys said I haven't started a handmaid's tale I'm a little scared to start it, to be honest with you. It's um, very difficult. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I, I just checked that that was the Cyber Monday deal, so that's uh -huh. done. Oh, is it done? Oh, I thought you could still yeah, do it. Was, it was the Cyber Monday deal because actually once I looked it up, I, I remember that I went there, I think, the next day. And then it was saying that it couldn't well, do I'll, it. So. I'll, I'll give you two my password. You're more than welcome to get in there and play around. <laughs> Because, I mean, it's just Hulu. Who cares, you know, right? Not just kidding, Hulu. <laughs> love you. <laughs> wow. And on that note. <laughs> Sponsor us, please, Yeah. Hulu. I'm joking. No, it's going to be fine. Anyway, so, I mean, between Amazon, Hulu, Shutter, Netflix, YouTube, do we really need cable anymore? I, I don't think no. so. Nope. Cut the cord. There. Cable. Screw you, cable. That's yeah, how I said. feel. Um, so we have talked about the Cecil Hotel in terms of like the murder investigation that took place in 2013, et cetera, et cetera. But I have really, I've listened to a couple of really great podcasts and done some research on it. And I've just felt really drawn, you know, particularly because it's not that far from where I live. Um, yet it's a world away and we'll get into that in a minute. But basically, wanting to go to the Cecil Hotel, it is far enough away. L.A. is a pain in the ass to drive to that I wanted to make a day of it. So a group of friends and I, and the video is posted on our Facebook page, actually traveled out to Los Angeles and spent the day going to some famous murder locations. Um, unfortunately, we didn't get as much 
open access to some of these places as we wanted to, but it was still historically interesting, fun day of friends, shitty day in traffic. Mm -hmm. And uh, to give you an idea of why we were so interested in the Cecil in particular, uh, Christy, tell us a little bit about the hotel. Since opening its doors in 1927, the Cecil Hotel has been plagued with unfortunate and mysterious circumstances. Over 16 different deaths by non-natural occurrences and unexplained paranormal events have taken place at the hotel over the years. On top of that, it has played host to some of America's most notorious villains. The Cecil was built in 1924 by hotel heir William Banks Hanner. It was supposed to be a destination hotel for international businessmen and social elite. Hanner, sp Hanner spared no expense on the Art Deco style design, eventually spending over one million on a marble lobby dam. Stained glass windows, imported palm trees, and an alabaster statuary. However, just two years after the Cecil Hotel opened, the world was thrown into the Great Depression. Oh, the area surrounding the Cecil Hotel soon fell into disrepair, becoming an unknown oh, becoming an area known as Skid Row. The once beautiful hotel soon gained a reputation as a meeting place for junkies, runaways, and criminals. Kind of like your hotel or your library. Just kidding. <laughs> and then the suicides began. All right. W.K. Norton, 46 years of age, was found dead in a hotel room at 640 South Main Street yesterday morning. A number of capsules believed to have contained poison were given by police as evidence that Norton had ended his own life. This would be the first of an astonishing number of suicides and disturbing violence, which would plague the Cecil for the next 86 years. The following year, a 25-year-old man shot himself in his hotel room. A year later, a young truck driver was fatally pinned against the hotel by a large truck. Oh. In 1934, another lonely man took his life. His throat slashed. Louis D. Borden, 53 years of age, former sergeant in the Army Medical Corps, was found dead in a hotel room at 640 South Main Street. A young woman plummeted to her death from the ninth floor of a Main Street hotel Friday night, killing an elderly man strolling on the sidewalk below. Miss Pauline Oton, 27, had been discussing marital problems with her estranged husband, Dewey, age 32, in the Hotel Cecil. Officers said she leaped or fell from the room when her husband went out to dinner. At first, police thought Mrs. Oton was George Giannini, age 65, might have leaped out of the window together, but they found the man had his hands in his pockets and his shoes still on. If he had fallen nine stories, the impact would have knocked his shoes off. But the suicides continued. In 1937, the Los Angeles Times reported, Grace E. Magro, 25 years of age, died early yesterday in Georgia Street receiving hospital. Police were unable to determine whether the woman had fallen or jumped from the hotel room. Telephone wires ripped from poles in her descent were entangled around her body. The officers stated that M.W. Madison, 26-year-old sailor of the USS Virginia, was the woman's companion, was sleeping at the time of the occurrence and could give no explanation for the woman's actions. Hmm. A year later... A Marine fireman named Roy Thompson, who had been at the Cecil for several weeks, was found dead in the skylight of the building next door after apparently jumping from his hotel room. The area around the Cecil, filled with single occupancy hotels and cheap watering holes, continued its inevitable decline into the last resort for lost, desperate people like Helen C. Gurney. A woman plunged to her death from a seventh-floor window of a downtown hotel yesterday afternoon. Her body landed atop the hotel marquee above the heads of pedestrians of busy Main Street. Long-term residents at the Cecil began to re refer to the building as the suicide. Amazingly, the horror at the Cecil Hotel was only just the beginning. And I will say also that the Cecil, not only known as the suicide, has been sued because of the amount of detriment they cause to neighboring businesses and other individuals as far as, you know, pain and suffering because constantly you're, they're seeing people 
land on the pavement in front of the Cecil. Constantly they're having their business interrupted and their parking blocked by police presence having to come in and out of this place. And regarding serial killers, due to the high number of unexplained deaths, rumors started surfacing that the hotel was haunted. To add to the rumors, the hotel acted as a temporary home for some of the grisliest murderers in American history. Today, the Cecil also bears the unofficial title of the most haunted hotel in Los Angeles. In 1985, Night Stalker Richard Ramirez lived in a room on the top floor of the hotel during the, the main period of his horrific killing spree. According to reports, he chose this hotel because of its reputation as being a total unmitigated chaos. Ramirez would allegedly return from a murder, leave his bloody clothes in the dumpster out back, and walk half naked back to his hotel room. In a place where drug deals happen in the open, and I'll tell you in a minute, they still do to this day, and overdose junkies lay undisturbed in the hallways for days, he would easily go unnoticed. In 1991, Austrian serial killer Jack Unterweger also called the hotel home. Rumor has it that he chose the hotel because of its connection to Ramirez. So to elaborate on Unterweger's story, it is fascinating. He is was a handsome, charismatic man who was a serial killer. His his signature was basically strangling women to death like with their own bra straps or pantyhose. And he had a certain way that he tied the knot and everything else. He was caught, incarcerated in Austria, and eventually became a writer, uh, you know, found Jesus, wrote a whole story about his past experience as a killer and about how he realizes it was wrong and kind of got people into the mind, which, you know, the fascination with true crime and serial killers. So it became a bestseller and he made a lot of money while in prison and became the poster child for prison reform in a way that was very political. You know, there were signs that this guy wasn't ready to be let out of prison and yet because he was handsome and charismatic and because politically they wanted to look like they were able to reform someone this heinous, they let him out. He came to Los Angeles inspired by Richard Ramirez. He got um, a couple of weeks at the Cecil Hotel saying that it was convenient for his ride-alongs with the police, which he had arranged in advance. He, The police did not do their due diligence. Uh, 90s, 90s Los Angeles Police Department did not do their diligence in looking into his background story. They didn't look to see if it checked out. And he got to do ride-alongs wherein he, A, got to see how the police force worked here in America, and B, got to actually kind of get off on seeing them respond to some of his own crimes wow. and had left, <laughs> went back to Austria just in time for them to figure out what the hell was going on. He did get caught and incarcerated. It's a fascinating story. That's another whole podcast onto itself. It sounds like it would be awesome to talk about. Yes, it's a great story. But another noted guest was Miss Elizabeth Short, who became known as the Black Dahlia. I'll have more on her in just a few minutes because I went to some of her locations. She reportedly stayed at the hotel just before her infamous and gruesome murder. Um, that was not, however, the last place she was seen, but I did go there as well. Um, and then in 1944, 13 years and six deaths later, a 19-year-old woman threw her newborn baby out the window, claiming that she did not know that she was pregnant and thought the baby had been stillborn. And also, by the way, she was entertaining a John at the time and went to the bathroom and had this baby and then threw it out the window. So, okay. Christy, what else? Oh, boy. <laughs> One of the most mysterious crimes ever to take place at the Cecil Hotel happened in 2013. Canadian college student Elisa Lamb was found inside. The oh, no shit. Okay, I've heard the story. I didn't know it was the Cecil. Found I think we talked about it, but it's kind of what got me looking into this hotel. Wasn't that on camera where it showed her in the, ca on yes. the, in the, in the elevator? It is the creepiest ass video, yeah. 100%. Yeah, okay. Anyway, sorry. Elisa Lamb was found inside the water tank on the roof of the hotel three weeks ew, after she had gone missing. Yeah. Her corpse was found naked in the water tank after hotel guests oh, had complained yep. of bad... I just want to <laughs> vomit right now. Complained of bad water pressure and a funny taste in the water. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> they got sued again for that one, oh, believe it or not. <laughs> how is this hotel open still? Oh, my God. Though authorities yeah. ruled her death as an accidental drownings, crit 
drowning, critics believed otherwise. Before her death, surveillance cameras caught Lamb acting strangely in an elevator, at times appearing to yell at someone out of view, as well as attempting to hide from someone. She also pressed multiple elevator buttons and waved her arms erratically. After the video surfaced publicly, many people began to believe that the rumors of the hotel being haunted might be true. Horror aficionados began drawing parallels between the Black Dahlia murder and Lamb's murder, pointing out that both women were in their 20s, traveling alone from L.A. to San Diego, last seen at the Cecil Hotel, and were missing for several days before their bodies were found. Wow. So to expand upon the Lisa Lamb story and why a lot of people, myself included, don't buy that that was an accident— um, somebody had to, okay, two schools of thought. Cecil is a shitty rundown hotel and the staff there sucks. Like they were never known for being the best at customer service or doing their job thoroughly. That being said, she either needed a key to get into that water tank or somebody had left it unlocked, which is wow. like I said, shitty staff, totally yeah. possible. But she was found naked in there. And the thing is, she, the, the way they figured it out, she would have had to have jumped in into the water tank, taking her clothes off then. Like, it was, it's a really, the video is strange. She, to me, looks scared. She looks like she's hiding from someone and trying to press the elevator buttons to keep behind the panel so that whomever she's afraid of in the hallway doesn't see her. Um, She posted some weird stuff on her social media shortly before she died. This part, I personally don't think is a conspiracy. I think that she... You can schedule, uh, Christy, as you know, social media posts to uh, post in the future, Mm -hmm. but her phone has always been missing, has never been found, and a social media post came out after she would have been dead. So that is creepy and interesting. But there's just a lot of things where I really think someone coerced her into getting in there. I mean, she did have a, a minor history of mental illness, so suicide isn't to be ruled out, but... It's a weird fucking story, uh, and that's another thing we could do another whole podcast on. But you can see why, as someone who's interested in history, as someone who's interested in, in true crime and and horror and all these things, I was very drawn to the Cecil. So yeah. the last body was found in the hotel in 2015. It was another man who had reportedly committed suicide. And the ghost stories and rumors are still swirl. The hotel even served as the all-too-true inspiration for the American Horror Story hotel season. The hotel had since been branded as the Stay on Main, and it does, even to this day, bear the original Hotel Cecil sign. And uh, uh, so here's what it is. And there was no, it's really weird. If you try to book a room at the Cecil Hotel, it will come up on like Travelocity, uh, Expedia, all those sites, And it looks like it's still open because the last reviews for it were like three or six months ago. It is not open. It is actually apparently being referred. It's all very hush hush. It's very interesting. I did a lot of research and couldn't find a lot of information. It is being refurbished. It is um, apparently going to be made into apartments, which is kind of also why, despite the fact that I couldn't go inside, I was kind of in a hurry to get down there before they completely redo it because I don't know if they're going to demolish it. Um, it's going to be part of the gentrification kind of of the Skid Row area because, man, that that is a shithole area. Um, you have that juxtaposition of Skid Row and everything you find there, library patrons, as Christy mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and, and the new, like, hipster demographic because the blocks around it are starting to have more expensive, nicer businesses and things like that. Uh, we went there. I brought my spirit box, which uh, of famous use during our library investigation. And there were tons of homeless people. Doesn't bother me. We literally, I went to the back alley to try to kind of get closer to the building. And my husband, who never tells me what to do because he knows better, was <laughs> like, stop where you are. And all my friends, we all stopped. And the tone of his voice, for once, I didn't mess with him or challenge him. There was a guy halfway down the alley that was currently using drugs. And I was like, so what? He just wants to be left alone. I want to go near this hotel, whatever. And they're like, you don't know. Like, there were so many little weird crevices in the alley and stuff. They're like, you don't know who's there. You're not on the main street anymore. Just don't mess with it. 
anymore. But mm-hmm. um, I did use my spirit box. I started to think that something was talking back to me, but it was super loud on the street. And I was garnering a lot of attention from some of the elements, the people that were there. So I went ahead and stopped. But I tell you what, the lobby is still exactly the same as it was since they refurbished it, which is they refurbished it to keep it the way that it was when it opened. So it has that 1920s vibe. It's very interesting. It's actually really pretty on the inside. I still feel super creeped out and super drawn to it. I wanted to go inside so bad. And I don't know why that's not normal. And I don't even know what else to say it. I would love to go again. I would love to get inside. There was a bird living inside of there just randomly. So I don't know where he got in from, but it's kind of interesting. So beyond the Cecil, because we were out there for the day, we did go past the Biltmore hotel. Unfortunately, there was some kind of marathon going on in LA. So traffic was even worse. We couldn't actually park at the Biltmore. But the Biltmore is a super fancy hotel, only a few blocks from the Cecil, that is um, was the last place that for sure the Black Dahlia was ever seen alive. And her story is super interesting. We ended up going to the Los Feliz uh, neighborhood of Los Angeles, which is super beautiful, super expensive, and really eclectic. All the homes are completely different. Like each home is different from the one next to it. And there's this place called the Soudan House, where now I think like a producer or something like that lives, but it looks kind of like a weird Egyptian pyramid. I posted all these photos on our Facebook page a couple weeks ago of the Cecil and also of the Soudan House. And that place is creepy. And I've been doing a little more research on the Black Dahlia lately. I'm super interested in her story. And I really have started to think that she ran afoul of the minor levels of the mafia that was very rampant in those days. There was a lot of police corruption, which I think is very much why her killer has not been caught. I think they know who did it. And I think that for various reasons, it was covered up or botched, you know, the investigation. But that house, there was a man, and I apologize, I don't have it pulled up right now. Um, A police officer, a retired police officer from the LAPD, wrote a book about how his father, who was a documented uh, mobster, lived in the Soudan house and actually had recorded, you know, the, the FBI bugged his house to catch him with some of his other crimes. And he said something about, oh, that Black Dahlia, if I killed the girl, they can't prove it now. So that was kind of an interesting, he had a basement that's super creepy, um, the, the police officer who wrote the book maintains that, um, cadaver dogs have indicated the presence of bodies in the basement of that home and they have never actually dug it up and confirmed that that's true. But that, that mob guy rolled with a lot of other dudes who just sort of like to hurt women a lot. And I honestly think she ended up possibly pregnant, maybe, because they also were running illegal abortion rings at the time and ran afoul of them in some respects. She definitely was known for borrowing money and not paying back. She definitely was known for uh, kind of advertising like she was going to put out and then not having sex, not sealing the deal, though she would still accept dinners out and you know cash cash gifts and all these kind of things and i think she was killed in the Soudan house and again you can see the picture of it on our facebook page super cool looking house and then the only other place we went to was the murder location because it's on the other side of the same neighborhood where the manson family actually their second round of murders the um La Bianca family, the couple, they actually killed them. It, it's kind of an interesting house, too, because it's in the middle of a neighborhood, but it's kind of almost a compound the way that it's got a big fence around it. Mm-hmm. And what a thing to kind of be in the middle of a neighborhood close to what should be safety, a very quiet neighborhood, and just randomly have these hippie assholes roll up on you, murder, torture, all these things. And that was another one of those weird things where I'm standing outside of this house And I just started crying. It was the same thing that happened the last time I was at the cemetery. And I haven't had that happen before that time and or in between. 
But man, all of a sudden I just, I didn't get any evidence of ghost activity, but boy, did it feel awful to stand there. And I don't know if I was just being empathetic to what had happened or if I was actually kind of, it felt like a place that was marked by bad things. And that's oh, how the sea salt happens. Of course. You know, um, but I don't know why I'm still drawn. The Cecil has a real history, as we just went through, of bad things happening particularly to women. There's a, there's rumors. There's another one that we didn't cover. There was a long-term resident there that everyone loved. She used to feed the birds outside the hotel. And she was just one day just completely cut to pieces and they stole all of her property and it was never solved. And that, that hotel women just inexplicably who seem happy just check in there and walk out the window like it's just the weirdest fucking thing yeah. and i've heard psychics and mediums on different podcasts and different tv shows talking about how they really believe that that property is possessed by a demon and that they've never there uh, my my friend um nicole strickland that did our library investigation that's this is what she does you know for fun is go to all these haunted locations and investigate she won't set foot in the place she won't go to the property she won't so it's just kind of interesting that it is draw draws me so much and that's kind of why i had so many of my crew come with me because i was like if anything if i act start acting weird just take me out of there and that's when my husband was just like stop you know when i'm just walking down this alleyway full of sewage like it's nothing so well, people are doing drugs because <laughs> yeah cause i'm drawn to go to this hotel more like that's not normal behavior you know not even for me and i'm pretty abnormal so Anyway, thanks for hearing me out. It was a really interesting trip. Do um, you guys have any questions or comments or anything about it? Well, you know what? The the Black Dahlia thing is, is definitely an interesting story. I was wondering, did, has anybody tried to make a, a movie or anything uh, based off of that incident? The there drama? was a terrible one, and it starred that cutie. Oh, God, give me one second. It was in the early 2000s, and it was poorly done. And it was based off of that book. Uh, yeah, I mean, I always, whenever I think about that, I, I actually think that was the first time that I ever saw a, a picture. This was back when I was younger, of like somebody literally cut in half. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. I always think about that just tossed out in the grass, <laughs> like, yeah. she, you know, like yeah, she wasn't like anything. Trash, yeah. you know, and I had wanted yeah. to go to where they found her. And that was a horrific story, too. It was a mom out walking her baby, her, her body being cut in half. The, the the official investigation they they kind of guessed that that was done just for transportation purposes purely for and that's why it's it, as gr as maimed as she was as much time as it looks like someone spent hurting her they also drained her blood and cut her in half and those were just practical decisions for dumping the body and that to me also kind of says mob you know they they just cleaned her up so that they can do a practical transaction of moving her to a new location. And that was the end of that. There's a lot of documentaries on her though. If you look them up, you'll find tons. I want good ones. Do you know any good ones? Uh, there's one that actually shows some crazy shit, like shows her body. Cause you know, they cut oh. her mouth from yes. her ear to ear. Um, let me think think of which one I did an awesome was. Halloween costume and I'll have to post it on Facebook it, this was years ago but I actually did the movie style makeup where I actually um it was able to make it look like my face was cut really deeply and then styled myself like her and then I wore a red sash around my midsection to you know show where she had been cut it's pretty dark but it was pretty fun I I, I did a good <laughs> job of it so myself so <laughs> Uh, I, I was just looking on Reddit because there was like a thread and I don't, someone says most evil did an episode that was three years ago on unsolved murders. Um, it just does one, including there are, I, I've seen, I've seen so many. I mean, if you look, um, you're going to see, there's lists of them. Uh, I don't know. Nice. I, I know I've seen them and I can't remember the names of them. Well, my I'm next scrolling. project will be to find a good one and recommend it to everybody because um, the story and the theories and, again, the level of police, uh, you know, that was right at the height of when all this police corruption was being found out with it, with them having mob ties. Whether she was involved in the mob ties or not has a lot to do with, I think, how the investigation was botched and or just completely covered up. Super interesting. If anybody knows of a good Black Dahlia documentary, please, by all means, hit us up on any of our social media because... I would love to see a good one. I have always been fascinated with her story, just 
the randomness of, I mean, being cut in half is, mm-hmm. but I mean, it, if you're just going to dump the body, why cut it in half? Like, what was the point of that? That's just, I all of that, that they, was kind of weird. However, they transported her. She was more compact, which is so gross to say, but I think that was the, the prevailing theory is that, you know, it was easier to fit her wherever they were going to stuff her before they threw her in the, threw her in the um, parking Yikes. lot. So. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I don't know. There's the, maybe they're looking too much into it, but you know they say that the incisions were very uh, doctor surgical. Surgical. Mm-hmm. Yes. And but the whole cut from the ear to ear. What? Why? I mean, it it it, it to me, and I know we all have theories. It just speaks of like a serial killer. Like, or somebody really fucked up, like, like Jack the Ripper or, you know, just the way that she was cut into almost like pleasure. That was like a pleasure in some way. Absolutely it was. And that's why I'm wondering if someone more sinister got a hold of her. They did say though, um, in this theory that I wrote, so I am referring to, I just read the Black Dahlia by Rick Geary. It is a graphic novel Mm -hmm. and um, he mentions the theory about the dad, the guy's dad having been the killer, but um, that guy said that his dad was responsible. There were several other women at that same level who went missing at the same time. So um, that's that his book is interesting too. the, mm-hmm. I don't have the title of it off the top of my head, but the guy who, I think it was something like my father was the black Dahlia killer or something really on the nose like that. So check that out. But, um, if we don't have any other thoughts on these topics, which there's a lot, I think we could really do about 10 more shows on some of these things. Mr. Yardley, uh, delirium next week, which I just watched. Tell I watched about- it too. Oh, did you? Okay. I did. Uh huh. Yeah, I uh, I haven't watched it. <laughs> it's my movie. <laughs> I'm gonna, no, I was actually I was actually gonna watch it. Um, you know, coming up uh, this next weekend. But uh, Delirium, it's a movie on Netflix. Would both of you say that it's more of a, um, a, a psychological thriller, or like how would you categorize uh, it? I don't... Oh, kind of uh, uh, paranormally thriller. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it. It was good. I, I, it was. I'm not gonna say anything okay. else. But yeah, I'd okay. categorize categorize it as. It's hard. It's one of those ones that has a twist. So yeah, uh, yeah. it's hard to categorize something. You know what you think it is, or what you don't think it is, and what it is. So. Well, let um, me read the synopsis real quick. Um, it, it's a man recently released from a mental institute inherits a mansion after his wealthy parents die. After a series of disturbing events, he comes to believe that it's haunted. And it's starring Topher Grace, who played, uh, you know, Venom in that third uh, Tobey Maguire uh, Spider-Man movie. Or that uh, 70s show. And that 70s yep, and show. That 70s. <laughs> or what was Absolutely. that movie? What was that I, What was that movie where... Um, Pat Hamilton? No. Well, yeah, that one's cute, too. I like that. Well, this one isn't cute, though. The one where he they're dr- he's like a prep school guy, and it's got Michael Douglas in it. And his daughter goes into like drug, you know, goes becomes like a drug addict, and he got her into the drugs. Anyway, traffic is that what it's called? Traffic. Uh, that is a movie about drugs that has Topher Grace in it. I don't that know. that must be it. Where he's a kid okay. and he gets her into drugs, and they find her at. It's got what's her name, uh, Christensen or whatever her name is, um, uh, as the daughter. Don yeah, Del- I Del- think Del Toro. That's it. Oh, that was a, a good. Yeah, he was good. Catherine Zeta Jones. Yeah. Yeah. Where he finds wow, that's he, a big pull, girl. That was two thousand. He would have been pretty young <laughs> back then. Yeah, so. he played. <laughs> he was in school. I remember, and I just remember that movie because it was really fucked up. Like, yeah. Whoa. It is. I mean, good I movie, was though. not a horror film, but very a good, good movie. If y'all want to check that out, yeah, it was really good. So, sorry, okay. keep going, Yardley. <laughs> oh no, I mean, <laughs> hey, well, hey, well, you know, I, I don't think I want to follow that. So, uh, <laughs> that's the movie that we're gonna check out uh, on the next oh, show, and I'm, I look forward to I look forward to watching it. So, uh, I think we'll have a lot of fun with that. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Watch along with us, Creepers, because, again, it's available on Netflix, Delirium, and uh, it's worth watching for the price of your already paid for Netflix subscription. <laughs> That's what I'll say about that. So, also, anyway. I wanted to say something real quick. Um, again, thank you for 
hanging with us while we get everything switched over to this new um, recording system. Hopefully the sound issues will fix themselves, still working out the kinks, but I think in the long run it'll work out. Um, I would really love to hear what you guys think are show topics, like your ideas. Um, totally. I, I, I'm always open to hearing what other people want to hear us talk about. Um, if it's a shut the fuck up topic, I mean, we can't do that. So I apologize to all the haters that are probably going to go in and go, we want you to sh- discover the shut the fuck up because you're annoying well, or whatever. Are you anyway, so <laughs> anyway yeah. so we'll just like go ahead and hammer that out now. Uh, so I would love to hear though, what, what you guys would, would love us to, um, research and discuss and put our opinions down on. So if you would like to chime in, by all means, find us on our social medias or email us and let us know what you think we should be talking about. Yeah, we've been getting some weird news from listeners, so that's been kind of nice. I really like the level of, um, you know, collaboration we've had with the people who listen to our show. So thank you all for that. And we owe you a drunken horror story on the Patreon. Oh, yes, we do. Yep. You know, I feel like for our, our hiatus, we should give them a freebie, you know, give them just the tip with <laughs> mm-hmm. the drunken horror story. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. that way it's a good way to advertise that you can find more of that on Patreon. Yep. Yep. We are on there making total fools out of ourselves. So if you think this with isn't, boobs. if you, yeah, if you think this <laughs> isn't foolish enough, just get on the Patreon yeah. and really go see how we deep the rabbit hole goes. To write our ship. Poor so guy. We, <laughs> we off the oh gosh. Yeah. yeah. It gets crazy, which drunk history is back on too, by the way, I've been watching. So. Yes. Those people are after my heart. It's I, to me. Oh, actually Topher Grace played, was it Thomas Edison? He was in like the drunk history thing. He was. Now that you mention yeah. it, yes. I freaking that yeah. was our that was my whole inspiration for drunk horror story is my life's goal, and you people out there can make it happen if we get enough people on social media requesting me, uh, is to be one of the storytellers on drunk history. Not. It just is. It's in my cards, people. It's what I should be doing. So come on, y'all. We're Let's get life. <laughs> get me on drunk history. You will not be. You won't regret it. I promise. All right. Well, on that note, we will bid adieu to our creepers. Thank you for creeping with us and all of our uh, long hiatus that we took. But we are looking forward to bringing you lots of new content uh, in the next couple weeks, and then in the new year. Thank you, guys. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, are we done? <laughs> oh, sorry. Yes, that was pause for effect. <laughs> oh, dun, dun, dun. Pause for the music hey, to come over. <laughs> I, I went the whole show, and I had this fan going in the background, so I don't know if my audio is going to sound crappy or not. I didn't realize until the end. <laughs> We're still recording. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to turn it off now. <laughs> Hey Hollywood, I'm here singing the blues. We lost someone, someone way too soon. Don't you say those words All I want to do is hear me Can you hear me? Don't you say those words All I want to do is hear me Can you hear me?